It seems like in world travelers hail from the great state of Ohio. That's right. So, yeah. Um, and of course, Brody is no exception. He's a full-time adventure skier, storyteller. Uh, he's been published in Powder, National Geographic Adventure, Outside Magazine. I mean, he gets around. He's got a tremendous amount of experience. And uh, I would like to offer a warm welcome to Brody Levin. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Please do. You guys hear me all right? Test, test, that works? No, it doesn't. Now it does. Oh, great, thanks, guys. Um, so this actually kind of goes off what was just being said that, um, was that McKenna that asked that? Is that you up there? Hey, McKenna. Um, a lot more goes into planning these expeditions and these trips around the world than maybe what you see in the videos that you watch or you look at in the magazines that you see or uh, the pictures and uh, or the books that you read about this stuff and there's a lot that goes into it it's not necessarily about are you willing to spend fifteen twenty thousand dollars to travel to some obscure country to go climb a mountain it's about are you willing to spend that ten or fifteen thousand dollars to travel to some obscure country get to the bottom of the mountain and then never climb it cool so traveling to ski the world without avalanche forecasts and Slightly contrary to what Craig said, I, I don't have a lot of experience compared to a lot of people in this room. I've only lived out of Ohio for, uh, I don't know, 10 or 12 years or something like that. And I've been, that's right, Ohio. I've been in the Wasatch for, I think this will be my ninth winter. But as a professional skier, I also spend a lot of my time outside of the Wasatch. I'm not always in this range. So while I'm not as intimately familiar with this range um, as many of you are, I am developing some methods that allow me to go to mountain ranges around the world and uh, come back safely from them. I'm Brody Levin. Uh, today is Halloween. Please follow me on Instagram. And here we go. So, skiing in places without avalanche forecasts. Why would you ever want to do that? Um, this picture was taken in Patagonia uh, on my birthday, actually. This was the only time I've ever skied on my birthday, October 5th. And I was on the upper uh, glacier approaching a headwall of this peak that we knew absolutely nothing about. We had been skiing. This is in Los Glaciares National Park, like all the way in Patagonia, right? This is where Fitzroy is. We had been skiing here for a couple of days, and we were gathering some information about the area. And this was kind of what we had been eyeing the whole time. And uh, as I was approaching the headwall, you can see kind of an obvious bergschrund, maybe three quarters of the way down the headwall. Can you guys see that there? Um, there's a crevasse that looked apparently filled in, so I continued up the upper glacier, got to the headwall, climbed the headwall, following that uh, looker's right ridge, got to the summit, started skiing off the summit, slowly, kind of icy, snow got a little bit better, stopped halfway down the headwall, like yelled to my partner down below me, I'm like, do you have any idea where the Bergschrund snap? And maybe three, four inches thick, maybe 10, 15 feet across, the slab was only big enough to move me like a couple of feet downhill. I stayed on my feet. Well, I stayed on my feet until my feet were out from underneath me and just dangling as I caught myself falling into the Bergschrun that I had stopped to look for. And so now I'm looking down below me, like I'm in this crevasse or I'm halfway in the crevasse. I'm holding myself up by my arms. My legs are dangling and I'm thinking, all right, I'm okay. Pull it together, you know, push myself out of the crevasse. But I'm thinking, what am I doing traveling around the world to go to mountain ranges where I'm just going to fall in crevasses with no chance of rescue when the Wasatch is pretty nice? And granted, mountain ranges all around the world don't have this guy traveling around trying to keep you on top. So why would we want to go to a mountain range on the opposite side of the world? Well, because they appeal to us, right? Many of us, we want to go there, we want to ice climb, we want to ski, we want to snowboard, and ranges that are going to put us back in that place of, of being the uninitiated, the unfamiliar. We want that feeling of solitude. And like, yes, this is my profession, this is my passion. I want every reason to travel all over the world to ski in ranges, but many of them don't have avalanche forecasts, especially avalanche forecasts as good as we have here in the Wasatch, or they have in the Tetons, or in Montana, or in California. So, how do we go about doing this safely? Well, one option is just to ski on avalanche debris the entire time. Uh, this was taken in Romania, and I showed up, and there was no snow in Romania. And uh, I ended up skiing this for a few weeks. Um, 
And this is sometimes what you get when you travel across the world. But when you're used to regions with really good snow and informative avalanche forecasts and experts like we have here, the thought of skiing in a different place, a different region, one without an avalanche forecast, can be a bit intimidating. Now, you add in the cultural differences or the logistics of traveling, and all of a sudden, avalanches might not be in the front of your mind when you're going skiing somewhere else. But just like here at home, avalanches need to be in front of your mind. And just like here at home, there is no golden ticket that's going to get you out of avalanches or out of avalanche terrain except staying home and not going into the avalanche terrain. But we're in a room full of people that are likely to head into avalanche terrain. That's why we're here. This was on a volcano uh, also. This is in Chile, actually. And uh, we had just climbed a rock ridge that we couldn't ski. And on the left side of the rock ridge, was this face that we had planned on skiing. But it turns out, you know, halfway up the face, it was just blue ice. There was all these rocky cliffs in it. We weren't going to ski it. Now, this face was off to our right as we were climbing this ridge. And we're like, OK, we're, it's mellower, but we're going to ski this. It's you know, a plan B. That's great. We have a safe exit off of this mountain. Now, granted, it was absolutely nuking when we were climbing this ridge. Like the, it was just blowing left to right, left to right, left to right, meaning loading this slope. But this slope, or sorry, the slope that was coming from, the upwind slope, didn't have any snow on it. It was solid ice. So we're like, all right, can't be loading it that badly. It's just windy, but there's no snow to really move. We get to the summit. We take some pictures, take our crampons off, put our skis on, and go to drop in this plan B, the safe face, and look what we're dealing with. It's one of like, the biggest, longest running avalanches I've ever seen. That's well over a mile and probably, probably almost a mile vertical, too. That's probably over 4,000 vertical feet down there to the toe of the avalanche. And that was scary. And this is a very real scenario here. This is not some like setup thing, right? We're like, okay, we can't ski the ridge we just climbed because it's rocks. We don't want to ski the face that was our plan A because it's ice. So what do we do? Do we ski the slope that obviously, obviously just avalanched, that is on the exact same aspect, the exact same uh, slope steepness as, as the slide itself? And it's easy to armchair this and sit back and be like, well, obviously you wouldn't ski that, but we need a safe way down. So what did we choose to do? We, choose to, we chose to ski right next to the avalanche path and just look over our shoulder every turn. And this will be an interesting, I'd, I'd love to hear if you guys have any feedback on that, because this was our one way off the mountain that wasn't ice and that wasn't rocks. So is this what we do? We got away safe, but just like what uh, Blaze was saying, like, did we just get lucky? So where do you go that doesn't have an avalanche forecast? This picture is, this is Cody Townsend and Chris Rubens in Spitsbergen in Svalbard, which is the northernmost inhabited land in the world. It's right by the North Pole. This was at like probably 78 or 79 degrees north in the middle of winter, which is not something I recommend doing. It was terribly cold. Um, but you don't necessarily need to be going to the North Pole in order to be skiing somewhere without an avalanche forecast. And you also don't need to be going somewhere without an avalanche forecast to be kind of forecastless, to not have something that applies to you. Maybe you just like hiking at the ski resorts here in the Wasatch be after they close or after avalanche control has ceased for the season. Or maybe it's so late in the season that avalanche forecasting is done for the season and you're pretty much skiing in the summer like I was. This was actually also in Romania. And uh, there was a couple skiers in this region. These are called the Buceg Mountains. And there are a few skiers to talk to, but they hadn't skied for months because this was very late in their season. And so I was completely on my own. There was you know, some information about the historical snowpack that I could garner from these other athletes that were in the area. But was I really getting much from them about what was going on in the summer and were there wet slides and were there roller balls and was there rock fall? No, because nobody was skiing. So one thing I do advocate when you're skiing in regions beyond the forecast zones is digging pits. Because I think probably a lot of people in this room, you don't dig pits on a daily basis when you go out. But if you have no historical evidence of what's been happening throughout the season. If you're not reading the website every day for the Romanian Avalanche Center, which doesn't exist, and you don't know what's been going on, dig a pit and get a little, glean some information on what's been going on throughout the season. Because you know what? It's not going to be the most informed decisions that you're making based off of this, but it's going to be one more tool that you're putting into your toolbox. Or let's take it a step further. You're not just in some weird country, but instead you're on your dream trip. You're heli skiing or hut touring in Europe or whatever, right? And you're standing at the top of a face that you've never seen before and you know nothing about. And the guide drops in, drops in, guide's making great turns, and all of a sudden your guide is gone. 
you, you don't know what happened to your crevasse, an avalanche, a rollover. You don't know what happened to your guide. But now you're standing there at the top of this face that you're not familiar with, and you have your partner or your spouse or your kid next to you. And you need to be able to figure out how to get off this face safely, because you don't carry a radio. You're a client, right? The guide's got the radio. What do you do? You can't just open your uh, phone and all of a sudden look at the UA, open your flip phone, that is, and look at the UAC app all of a sudden, can you? You're on your own. Same went for here. This is Mount Jefferson in Oregon, um, which is probably within a forecast zone, but this was like August. There was no avalanche forecasts going on. We were on our own. We might as well have been anywhere else in the world. And it's easy to ignore all of this when you're, maybe you're doing a base camp style expedition or you're doing a long, dry approach like I was here. We were going to ski up underneath Fitzroy. And we could have been in shorts and t-shirts here. It was warm. The last thing we were thinking about was avalanches. We were more thinking, do we have enough food for a few days? Where's this place we're sleeping? Whatever. We have a long, dry approach. The same went here, going to the Three Sisters in Oregon. That was just this summer. Or maybe, like I said, you have a base camp style setup. We were living outside of a van, or out of a van and it was warm down there. We were not thinking about winter. But once we started climbing higher and higher, all of a sudden, it started to feel a little more wintry. And you can see the avalanche that actually broke on the right side of the frame here. That was not something we had expected to see when we were like running around the van in shorts just 24 hours before this. And we continue climbing. We're heading up toward the, it doesn't even look like a peak here, but it's just to the right of Fitzroy there, pretty much in the center of the photo. And we're getting up to it. And all of a sudden, we're on top of it. And we've summited. And we're stoked. But we're looking down at a face that we know nothing about. We might as well be in, you know, in the Himalaya or in California or anywhere else that we're not intimately familiar with. And all of a sudden, it's winter. We were like looking down at a ski face, and we were in shorts earlier, and now we need to figure out if we can, thank you, if we can uh, get out of here safely. And also, forecasts don't always apply to you. This picture is just taken in, this is taken in a forecast zone on the edge of Yellowstone National Park in Montana. And this is a run that's not skied very frequently, right? This is a run that we had, uh, we had read the updated avalanche forecast. We had jumped on snowmobiles, gone to the wilderness boundary, hiked in with a bunch of stuff, set up a base camp, skied for a few days right outside Yellowstone National Park. And this was kind of the crown jewel of the entire trip. This is what we had been eyeing, and this is what we wanted to ski. But all of a sudden, we didn't have an updated avalanche forecast. We had read something a week ago. Does that apply? And if it did apply, would it apply to this weird corner of the range that no one ever goes to? But what we had lost in formal avalanche, uh, updated avalanche forecasts throughout the week, we had gained in practical knowledge and experience and observations and empirical evidence that we were gathering ourselves. You need to regard your own observations very highly, especially when there's nothing else to be regarding because you're out there on your own. Maybe you're out there on your own for a really long day and you read the forecast at 7 a.m. or maybe you started before that, so you haven't read the forecast since yesterday. This is on the southwest couloir of Mount Moran. Again, Grand Teton National Park, a forecasted area. But the forecast that we read the day before, we got on our bikes at 5 a.m. to ride 15 miles to the trailhead to go climb this thing. We were probably eight hours deep at this point and it had been dumping all day. There was so much fresh snow. So is that forecast, or, or that forecast really relevant to us anymore? You don't need to be leaving the country or going to the Nepal in order for this stuff to apply to you. You need to be able to be your own forecaster. Before the logistics, before the plane tickets, before finding some unskied face, or even deciding where you want to go, you need to be able to answer to yourself and to your partner, to your own family and to your partner's families. Are you ready to make your own decisions without any outside influence? This was in uh, the Cordillera Blanca of Peru. Are you ready to deal with the consequences for yourself and for the rest of your team? This uh, just a quick story. This is my friend Matt, and this is uh, Luke tending to him. This is the Little Cottonwood Canyon, a very forecasted zone. We found Matt in the backcountry. We skied one line together, and Matt snapped his femur in half after he hit a rock. He was in an avalanche gully. He was highly exposed. This was a Saturday. It was a pow day. It was packed, just heading back to Little Cottonwood Road. He had to be not only his own, he didn't have to be his own forecaster that day, because we had forecasts, but we had to be his lifeline this day. And so this brings up, are you not only ready to be your own forecaster, but are you ready to be your team's lifeline? It had been dumping all day. There was all these people skiing ahead of us, or above us, I mean. Were we prepared for the snow? Yes. Were we prepared medically? Had we had recent training? Yes and yes, and we got Matt out of here safely. Unfortunately, Matt actually passed away um, 
just two months ago, right around the anniversary of JP, Liz's, and Andreas's death, which kind of brings us all together that the consequences are similar no matter where you're skiing, but the risks and your risk tolerance change. And that's going to go here in Alaska as well as you're flying into a remote, this is the Alaska range, all of a sudden we're not going to have avalanche forecasts anymore. Are you ready to not have that red, yellow, green warning system that we're used to? In Iceland, I did have a red, yellow, green warning system, but that was on the opposite side of the country where there's actually forecasters, and that's in stuff that's been skied. This line had never been skied before. So while there was a town at the bottom of this couloir, I might as well have been on the opposite side of the planet because I didn't know anything about the snow. No one had ever been in there before, and the forecasts are happening very, very far away. But if you can say yes to these things, if you are ready to go without that system, if you are ready to be your party's lifeline and your own forecaster, you're stoked. And like this is in the Stettner Kular in the Grand Teton. And you can get to these places that are forecasted or not. Maybe you can end up in, this is the world's northernmost active volcano. It's called uh, Beerenberg. And it's, thank you. Um, and it's 500 miles from the nearest landmass. There is definitely no avalanche forecast there. In fact, there isn't a person for 500 miles. This is the summit of Beerenberg. Maybe you're biking up Tioga Pass well after the forecast season has ended. You need to be able to come up with your own forecast because even though it feels like summer, you get higher and there's avalanche danger. Uh, real quickly, I need to hurry up. Uh, so there's alternative resources besides just you know, avalanche.org, right? You can go to walk into a mountaineering club. Once in Peru, I just walked in there. I found a bunch of guides, and they just started giving me information, information, because they're the ones that are out there every day. Actually, guide services, as kind of a generous uh, contribution to the greater climbing community, are usually pretty willing to give information. The worst you can do is ask. And they also, t or excuse me, the worst they can do is say no after you ask. And uh, they also tend to speak English, kind of whether, wherever you are in the world. So, Look at guides. Don't, don't be too hesitant for the guides. Look at web forums. That's a lot of armchair skiers, but it's also a lot of skiers that come home at the end of the day and post about conditions. If there is a snowy mountain, there is probably an enthusiast nearby that gets after it every day. Find him or find her. Ask about conditions. And uh, visible evidence, never leave your avalanche toolbox at home. Make sure you're carrying the same tools with you, whether you're skiing in the Wasatch or skiing in the Wakhan, it does not matter. You want to find the, or use the same tools no matter where you are. And underground forecasts, frequently there's just like a tourist tram or some kind of gondola or some kind of chairlift in these mountain ranges around the world. Go to the top of that thing and find the little ski patrol hut and walk in there. And maybe don't ask what avalanche conditions are because they might deny it. Alex Tarrant, if you're here, like she, she works in Chile a lot and they'll, they'll frequently deny that avalanches happen there. But if you ask about recent avalanche incidents, they can't deny that. They'll be like, oh yeah, someone was buried yesterday, but you're fine, go ahead. Take that information lightly, take it with a grain of salt, and use it uh, how you might use it. Here, this is the highest volcano in North America. This is in Mexico, and while there's no formal avalanche center, there are a lot of guides that take clients up there. So we contacted them, we found out what's been going on in the upper mountain. It turns out it's just ice the whole way, but no avalanche danger there. Um, use what you know, never leave home without that avalanche toolbox, wherever you're going in the world. And remember, keep it in front of your mind. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. So people tend to, uh, etiquette around the world varies, ski etiquette. Those of you that have skied in Europe, I'm sure much more than I have can attest to this if you're doing something like the Haute Route. But uh, this, was, this was just at the, underneath the summit of Denali, and this was all socked in just a couple minutes before, and I had skied down having no idea that all these other people were right there. <laughs> this, and then I'm going to get done here, I was about to drop in at the Green Arrow on this unskied couloir in Romania. And uh, the photographer, my partner, was across Valley where this photo is taken from. And right, I'm like counting down to drop in on the radio. And she comes on. And she's like, hang on. I'm like, no, thank you. I want to ski. Thank you. Um, she's like, no, no, no. People are entering the couloir. And I'm like, what do you mean people are entering the couloir? Turns out three hours later, these guys topped out. I was just sitting on top of the chute waiting for them. Because I don't know what Romanian ski ethics are, but I know my ethics tell me not to just drop in on top of somebody else. Lastly, it's important to note that I have a risk tolerance that I've accepted that allows me to make my own judgments wherever I am in the world and live or not live with those consequences. And that's something that you have to ask yourself before you go somewhere that's not forecasted or before you go somewhere, say like you're just going to Mount Nebo or Deseret Peak or Cascade, something around here that the forecasters aren't visiting there every day. You need to be able to consider these things because you know what, like that forecast you read might not be perfectly applicable to that area. 
So use the resources available, get creative with them, and employ that knowledge that you already have. Be your own forecaster. And understand that base camp might have very different conditions than what's going on up high. And you have to be able to answer to yourself and your partner, remember that. It's vital to ask yourself these hard questions before venturing into avalanche terrain that you are unfamiliar with or that is not forecasted for. Because the couloir that you're looking at across the world on Google Earth, it might look enticing on the computer. Or those web forums that tell you you should totally come ski these faces in country blank. They might look good until you get there and you can't just look at your phone and get the green light from the UAC app. I've gone over, but I think I have a couple minutes for questions. Any questions?